um, great talk, and let's welcome our next last speaker, Vikram Gadgakar from Columbia University. Okay, great. Uh, do you see my slides and do you hear me? Okay, all good. Uh, so good afternoon, and uh, it's great to be here. Uh, my name is Vikram Gadakar, and I'm an assistant professor at the Zuckerman Mind Brain Behavior Institute at Columbia University. I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me this wonderful opportunity to speak at VIDA today. So let me start my talk with a little story about the great pianist Arthur Rubinstein, who was apparently walking along the streets of New York one day when a pedestrian approached him and asked him, how do I get to Carnegie Hall? Rubinstein pondered this question for a second and said, practice. So indeed, many of our behaviors are not innately programmed, but are acquired through a process of trial and error or practice. Much of our understanding of the neural mechanisms underlying trial and error learning comes from the study of animals engaged in various tasks motivated by primary rewards like food or juice. Put a rat in a box with a lever and he will learn by trial and error to press the lever for a food reward. Classic experiments in the 1950s by Olds and Milner showed us, for example, that we can remove food from the equation if we hook up the lever to an electrode with which the rat can self-stimulate his dopamine neurons. If you do this, the rat will learn to press the lever not for food, but for a squirt of dopamine. Now, we are all familiar with the addictive properties of dopamine and also the reinforcing properties of dopamine. And especially, we are very aware of that dopamine neurons encode what is called reward prediction error. Now, you must have all seen this plot a million times, and I was going to skip it, but they actually made me sign a contract saying that I have to show this graph, otherwise I'm not allowed to speak today. So here goes. So these data show the response of a midbrain dopaminergic neuron that projects to the basal ganglia of a monkey that has been trained to associate a light cue with the juice reward one second later. Since the light is presented at random, the appearance of the light is a positive prediction error and is signaled by a phasic increase in firing rate. Now, one second later, when the monkey is expecting juice, if you withhold the reward, that would be a negative prediction error and is signaled by a phasic suppression in firing rate. These phasic increases and decreases in firing rate are thought to positively and negatively reinforce preceding motor acts, thus leading to learning. The principle of dopaminergic reward prediction error has been highly influential in neuroscience. However, Many of our motor skills like speaking or playing a musical instrument are not, are not learned for immediate food or juice rewards, but are instead learned by comparing ongoing performance to internal goals. Does dopamine also play a role in the learning of such behaviors? To answer this question, we previously turned to the zebra finch. The adult zebra finch song is a naturally learned, highly stereotyped motor sequence. And juvenile finches appear to make a copy of their cuter song through a process of trial and error or practice. Furthermore, the zebra finch brain contains an interconnected set of brain regions called the song system that is dedicated to song learning, including a dopaminergic projection from VTA to area X, which is the singing related basal ganglia. Inspired by the mammalian literature on external reward prediction errors, we and others hypothesized that VTA transmits a conceptually similar error signal for song learning, even though song is internally evaluated. When I was a postdoc in Jesse Goldberg's lab, I tested this hypothesis by recording from antidromically identified area X projecting VTA neurons in singing birds while I fooled the birds into thinking they made a mistake. The way I did this was to selectively distort certain target syllables with distorted auditory feedback. The idea is that a distorted syllable should sound worse than expected to the bird and should lead to negative prediction error signals. Here is an example neuron that I recorded during this paradigm. What we have here is the undistorted and distorted spectrograms, example neural traces, raster plots, and firing rate histograms. Time is on the x-axis and zero corresponds to the target time when we either distort or not. Looking at these figures, you can see that this neuron shows a distinct suppression in activity immediately after distortion on every single trial consistent with a distorted syllable sounding worse than expected. Similarly, the same neuron shows an increase in activity following target time when the syllable was not distorted consistent with an undistorted syllable sounding better than expected. We call such error signals, performance prediction error signals, since these are, being, these are not being produced in response to an external primary reward. 
Now, we were, of course, very excited with this result because one, this identified the long sought after error signal for song learning. And two, more broadly, this suggested that the principle of dopaminergic prediction error can generalize to the learning of complex motor sequences that are not learned in the pursuit of primary rewards, but are learned by comparing performance to internal goals. However, one of the criticisms of this work stemmed from the fact that we had used an external feedback sound to distort the syllables. So the question was, how, how are we so sure that these are actually performance prediction error signals? Maybe these neurons are just responding to the presence or absence of the feedback sound as if it were an aversive stimulus. While we presented several lines of evidence arguing that these are, in fact, performance prediction error signals, this motivated me to ask if there is a direct way in which we can test if these neurons care about the quality of song independent of the distortion paradigm. So to answer this question, I initiated a collaboration with Adrian Fairhall and her group. And the story I'm going to tell you now is primarily the work of her graduate student and now postdoc, Alison Duffy. So let's look at the question a little more carefully. So here's an expanded view of the raster plot. So I just told you a second ago that there are very few spikes here because the syllable that preceded this time was distorted. So it was of low quality. Similarly, there are lots of spikes here because the syllable that preceded it was undistorted. So of higher quality. Now, what if we look away from the target time? Let's say we look at this region. It looks like there are quite a few spikes here. Now, is that because syllable A happened to be sung better on those trials? Similarly, there seem to be fewer spikes on these trials. Is that because syllable A happened to be sung better on those trials? In other words, does the song quality at a particular time in the song predict the number of spikes that occur after a brief latency? So to answer this question, Alison used a Gaussian process model approach, which I'm going to briefly describe here in cartoon form. So let's say we have three renditions of song and three simultaneously recorded neural traces. The first step is to parameterize the song into a set of eight different song features, two of which are shown here, pitch and entropy. Then we construct an individual model of spike count as a function of pitch alone, another model of spike counts as a function of entropy alone, a combined model of spike count as a function of both entropy and pitch and so on. And then we take a weighted average of all these combination models to compute an eight dimensional full model of spike count as a function of all the song features. This model then gives us a goodness of fit or an R squared value. So note here that we have one R squared value for a particular song window spike window pair. Now we can repeat this procedure for all latencies. So all song window spike window pairs and all the syllables in our data set. And we, and we can look at all the R squared values in our entire population. And then we can ask, first of all, are there good fits? And if so, at what latencies do they occur? So here is a summary plot of our population data shown as a histogram. On the x-axis is the song spike latency, so which is the time between the song window and the spike window. On the y-axis is the normalized count of good fits. The blue line shows the real data. The black line and the gray shading is the mean and standard deviation of shuffle data, where we shuffle the correspondences between the singing renditions and the spike trains. So looking at this plot, you can see immediately that there is a preponderance of good fits at a brief positive latency of about 50 milliseconds. Now a positive latency suggests an evaluative process because what this means is that the spikes that care about how the song was sung are being produced after the song was sung. But does this latency of 50 milliseconds actually make sense with respect to what we expect? So here's a plot of the experimental results from the feedback experiments that I showed you earlier. And what I have done is I have stretched the x-axis to match the x-axis of this plot, just to show you that the latency of 50 milliseconds that we found in our new population analysis exactly matches the kind of latencies we saw in our feedback experiments. That is, the dopamine neurons in the feedback experiments began to care about the presence of the feedback about 50 milliseconds after feedback onset. As another control, we also analyzed a population of VTA neurons that did not project to area X and that did not have an error signal. 
And so the idea is that if we do a similar analysis for that population, we should not see a peak like this. And indeed, when Allison looked at that population of the non-responsive neurons, she did not see such a peak. So these results suggest that song quality does indeed predict dopamine spiking with a brief positive latency, which is consistent with an evaluative process. And so broadly, we think this suggests that these dopamine neurons do indeed seem to care about how the song is being sung independent of our external feedback paradigm. The next question we wanted to ask is, can we learn something by looking at the nature of these fits, the shape of, of these relationships? Now, it turns out that even after an adult bird has learned to sing, he moves around his song features, let's say pitch, a little bit during the day or he maintains a certain manner of singing. And so what kind of shapes do we expect to see? So here's a cartoon plot of spike count versus song feature. And let's say we see a linear shape like this. What would this mean? Now, we know that high dopamine spiking is supposed to reinforce and low spike counts extinguish. And so a shape like this would mean that the bird is perhaps trying to move his pitch up. Similarly, a shape that looks the opposite could mean that lower pitch is preferred compared to higher pitch. And this would be consistent with the bird trying to move his pitch down. We call these kinds of shapes directional. We could also have a shape that we call stabilizing where an intermediate pitch is positively reinforced with high spike count and deviations from this are negatively reinforced with low spike count. This is a shape you would expect when a bird has already converged on the pitch he wants to sing and, and he's just trying to maintain that pitch. Now, there is another kind of shape that you might expect called disruptive, where a low pitch is good, high pitch is good, and intermediate pitch is not good. Now, this is not a shape that you are likely to see in an adult bird that has already learned how to sing. And so we do not expect to see such shapes. Now, it turns out that Gaussian process models, which we used before, are not very good at giving us shape information about fits. And so we did a new set of analyses using generalized linear models to look at the shape information. So Allison constructed generalized linear models with both linear and quadratic bases to see what kinds of shapes we see in our fits and whether they make sense with respect to what we would expect. So here is the summary plot of all the different kinds of shapes that we saw in our relationship. So each dot here represents one particular fit of a song window spike window pair to one song feature. The x-axis is an information criterion. And all that is saying is that as you go from left to right, quadratic fits become better and better at explaining the data compared to linear. The y-axis is the quadratic coefficient. And all that is saying is that if that is less than zero, the fit is stabilizing. And if it's greater than zero, it's disruptive. So taking a closer look at this, what, what does this actually mean about the shapes? So first, before zero, so we can see that there are a bunch of fits here that are directional, which would be consistent with the birds making micro corrections to their song. We have a large number of stabilizing fits, as we would also expect. We do have a smaller number of disruptive fits. However, as quadratic becomes a better and better descriptor compared to linear, the fraction of stabilizing fits increases. So in other words, this is another way of saying that the best fits in our population were either directional or stabilizing, and very few were disruptive. As another control, we looked at the histogram of the fraction of stabilizing fits in our real data shown in blue and the shuffle data shown in gray. Shuffled again is shuffling the identities between the singing renditions and the spike trains. And you can see that the real data had significantly more number of stabilized or fraction of stabilizing fits compared to disruptive fits. So taken together at the population level, this is suggesting to us that dopamine firing during natural song is consistent with the birds either making small corrections to their song or maintaining their songs, as we would expect. So to summarize, we used Gaussian process models to show that the latency of singing and dopamine spiking suggests an evaluative process. We then use generalized linear models to show that the shapes of these song spike fits are consistent with active song maintenance. And we think that taken together, these results suggest that spontaneous dopamine spiking 
can evaluate natural behavioral fluctuations unperturbed by experimental events such as cues or rewards. Before I finish, I'd just like to say that I have started my own lab at the Zuckerman Mind Brain Behavior Institute at Columbia University recently, and we are exploring questions related to how the brain evaluates behavior, both self-generated, like how do male songbirds evaluate their own songs, but also the behavior of others. So how does a female songbird evaluate the song of a male in order to determine if he is attractive or not? If you're interested in such questions and excited by New York, please get in touch with me. I'd like to thank Alison Duffy for doing a wonderful job with this project, Kenneth Latimer, Jesse Goldberg, and Adrian Fairhall. I'd like to thank my funding sources, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Okay, um, I have a question from Arif Hamid. Uh, awesome talk. The 50 millisecond window from your analysis, interesting. Is this perhaps the refresh rate on evaluation of performance? What process do you suggest imposes this window and could the training change it? Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Um, but I think, I think uh, 50 to 100 milliseconds or so that we saw in our experiments, I think makes sense in terms of the time it takes you know, for the feedback to reach, you know, you know, the bird has to sing, the bird has to listen to himself sing, and, and the feedback sound has to go through the auditory system and has to reach the, reach the dopamine, dopamine neurons. So I think if you add up those latencies, I think you know, several tens of milliseconds would, would make sense to me. And do you think this could be you know, changed across training? Um, you mean uh, whether we can use training to, to train the birds to, to use feedback to change an earlier part of the song than they would naturally do? It might be possible. Uh, it might be possible, but I would suspect that that might then recruit different mechanisms than what they're naturally using. Because in, during natural singing, I think these kinds of delays are probably constraints of the, of the biophysics and, and the neurons, so. Um, I have a question. Do you yeah. know, maybe it was already done, or I'm not sure. Um, do you know how disrupting the dopaminergic system is there in uh, while the birds learn the song or later on in life will affect their capacity to sing or vary their songs? Yes, yes. Uh, these studies have been done. Uh, so after we published our paper, there were several uh, studies that came out from other groups, uh, like from Rich Mooney's group, Todd Roberts' group, uh, and Sam Sober's group. And they, uh, they looked at this specific question. So one of the cool things you can do with birds is you can actually selectively distort low pitch variants of their syllables and get them to move their song to, to avoid this feedback. And, and so they showed that optogenetically either activating or silencing dopamine neurons can, can, disrupt, this, uh, can disrupt this behavior. And if, for example, you will completely destroy this, uh, the dopaminergic system? They... Well, if you, so you can show that if you silence these neurons, for example, you can prevent the birds from, from doing this kind of learning. So, so you need the dopamine system for this behavioral modification that, that they can do. Great. I don't see any more open questions. Just in time. So thank you very much again. Thank you. Great.